Do I put up a transition? So this is just to broadcast it, so we're not going to mess with this one. We'll just rotate it when you're done for the panel. Okay. So I'm going to start uh, that presentation. She told me to start the first 30 minutes, present something. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So are you going to need a computer at the podium? Yeah. But do you have a clicker or we don't have a clicker? I can sit here. Okay. Okay. I I'm going to be loud. I don't think okay. we need a clicker. I can sit here. Okay, so where do you stand? Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay. Can I sit here? So then, yep, so it'd be perfect. All right. Should I start it? Where's Debbie, my boss? Uh, my two bosses are sitting next to each other. Stop. Perfect. Let me know. You're good. Yeah. So I'm going to get started. If I can get your attention. My two bosses are sitting next to each other. They asked me to start. Uh, my name is Abdel Tefrish. I'm in charge of a lot of products from Career Builder. I'm also moving toward more software building ecosystem. I report directly to the C CEO. I'd like to do this event to collect your feedback. On a weekly basis, we review the feedback. What's the friction, some of the challenges you're having and then we convert it into our strategy. And one of the strategies has been uh, Broadbean, we acquired Broadbean. I'm gonna share with you guys why we acquired them, a little bit of story behind them. And, uh, and like I said, I would love to hear your feedback. We wanna make sure the session is interactive. We have some gift, I believe. Well, you guys already got the gift, or should, should I give you guys a gift after the, the session? <laughs> <laughs> so, what I wanna do is, and Kelly can tell you for the past three, four years, I love to hear your insight, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then I will react to it. That's why I call her my boss. She know my developer. If I don't develop something, she goes directly to my developer. I'll give you the business card for my developer. So let me share with you guys. I like to start my presentation with the BLS data. Uh, the joint report, as of May, say there is 4.6 million jobs. I think there is always misconception in the US when you hear there is only 200,000 jobs, you know you hear every month there is 200,000 jobs. Actually, that is a delta between job created and job destroyed. In order for the employment in the United States to go down, that number have to be above 120,000. And the last two months it's been two or 300,000. But actually there is 4.6 million average job a month in the United States. Is a BLS job to go. So what I'm gonna talk to you guys about is where those 4.6 million jobs are. And we categorize them, we work with the BLS, we crawl ourselves the internet. We have career builder close to 800,000 jobs a month. And we crawl the whole 4.6 million. We work with the BLS, we also work with the Federal Bank. So I'm gonna share with you guys, the biggest thing this year, and it's been very consistent, month after month, the number one job category is sales. This is why a lot of you gonna experience high, high turnover in sales. How many of you are high, looking for sales position? How many of you are experiencing a little bit high sales turnover from retail to sales? Yeah. I, I would say 80% of the client that I talk to, I either review the sales comp plan or changing it. And the primary reason why, because a lot of sales people have options. For us, this is a sign that the economy is fully recovering. Because the first thing people cut Actually, they cut too deep when there is a recession, is a sales bench. Now, every company you talk to, they're like, I'm trying to rebuild my sales bench, but I'm trying to also reduce my turnover. What do I do? So everybody's running to that. From retail to insurance to financial, every bank I client I talk to across the board, including uh, technology. The second one is IT. Anybody, how many of you are hiring IT? Very <laughs> right? Here's the good news with IT. The mail's never been high, the supply has never been that low. So job security for you. But it's really a challenge in the United States because the primary challenge is because um, the number of computer science graduates, the job, uh, the chart is going away, the number of computer science graduates is flat. And the primary reason is because of female. 66% of, I think 60% of college graduates this year are gonna be female, less than 12% are going IT. The only way to solve this problem when I have the same discussion next year, is getting more female in uh, STEM. And then I think the rest of your family, healthcare is third. And then 
I think the other thing that we've seen a uh, trend uh, that a client tell us is any position that require your hand, there is shortage. Meaning welders, drivers, the, all the trade labor skills, they cannot find them. What I'll share you, this is um, my favorite part, is I would like to read a financial statement from CEO presentation. I like to read what they are, none of the CEO what they write. And Allah, every CEO presentation, this is globally, you always see the line, uh, people are number one asset. That's not familiar? Actually, I type it in Google, there is 43 million results. Uh, people are really are number one asset, and you can see people making jokes about it. <laughs> and I, I cannot believe the first one. Uh, people are really are most important asset. And, and if you ask the CEO globally, I want probably visit 12 countries this, this year, the biggest challenge, you ask them where the, is the human capital. They have to hire them. They will tell you our number one goal is we got to hire top talent, we got to retain top talent, everything around talent. So if we do that, we'll succeed. <laughs> then it's always a trick. Are you investing in talent management software? No. Are you spending more time with talent? You ask the same survey. There is a, always a paradox. And Kelly hear me saying that. And, it, and every year I can get you more material. I want to ask you, Kelly's doing a really good job in trying to close that gap. And look, I work in manufacturing 20 years ago. My CEO at any given time, supply chain. Any supply chain, you work in any manufacturing, you ask them, the CEO know at any given time where they're getting the part, how much order there is, and who is the suppliers, what component they have for their part. For, they basically have the supply chain for their product. Then you ask the same question on your talent. He doesn't know how many people he have for that skill set in the company. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to always ask that question, why is there is a gap between supply chain for the product and supply chain for the talent? All right, guys, I'm going to lock the door. Nobody's leaving this room until I get some people. <laughs> Why do you guys think everybody know about every component? Steve, you want analytics. You know every component, every piece. You does analytics. You want to tell them your background. I'm going to call you out. <laughs> so you actually, he had a good story. He came from predictive retail for all the product. Now he's trying to apply for a job. You are you going to solve this problem. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. No, even knowing the talent. I mean, just say what's your background and say what you're doing no, now. Yeah, so I've, I've looked at, uh, I've done sales forecasting for retail stores. I've done forecasting at a bottom level, at a, at a product level. Um, and uh, marketing analytics, marketing strategy. Uh, so, you know, really looking at data and trying to tell a story with it and see what it tells you as far as trends and where things are going. Um, so. So now, so I'm more of a traditional finance and analytics background now in HRIS and uh, what's, what's planning and analytics. So trying to now look at people data and trying to see what are the trends with people data, how is it related to financial data, you know, how the correlations there, um, and just really trying to get some insights in that to help track the business. So what do you see in the biggest challenge? What do you see now that you came in from a different perspective? Here's a guy that was just joining us up. What do you see in the biggest challenge compared to the field you work? I think, it, well, a big challenge, too, is, uh, is having good data. I mean, it's one thing, too, having the tools and the, and the infrastructure to, to capture the data and try to centralize it, um, you know, because I know at Staples, people used to report from different systems, yeah. and the data could be different. Uh, you know, even though it's, it's sales, it's, it's comps, it's profit, it was different because the sources were different. So we've got a, the data source, but we're trying to clean it up too. So with HR data, um, what we report on is only as good as what we have in Oracle, like how things are input. So I think a challenge for us, also from a global perspective, because we're working with Canada and Europe, um, and even within Home Goods and, and Marmax, just making sure that when we're looking at a certain metric, whether it's terminations or headcount, it's looked at the same way. We're trying to have some data state. So that's going to have an issue that we're having, uh, making sure that if we show this one way, well, Europe doesn't look at it that way because they just put time story in terms of what yeah. happens. So we want to make sure we stay in that process. Cool. Yeah. James, go ahead for GE. Yeah, so I think the gap between HR systems and financial systems is the space I can probably talk to the best about. 
is that no one who dies or goes to jail if we get a hit count law. Got it. You know? I mean, no one's going to, the IRS is not going to come audit you if you yeah. get your head count wrong. The SEC is not going to come do a dawn raid if you get it wrong. Yeah. And so the precision and the problem of backdating, I tell my, my people from audit staff who come to my office all the time, I tell them, look, I can change that. I can make you a manager a week ago. You actually want that if I make you a manager a week ago because I give you retroactive pay. You know, so there's all sorts of differences that mean sometimes that the equality can be a little bit softer, yeah. but also the scrutiny from external sources is very high on either from the customer side, but also from the financial oversight side that means you have to get certain other pieces of data right in a way that we haven't yet in HR. I think we're getting that, yeah. but it's just taking some time. And you're right, that's a great point. I mean, you're absolutely right. The stakeholder, the pressure is much higher. And to your point, if you miss financial number, you mislead it, you're going to jail. Yes. You don't have, if you miss the talent forecast, the talent recruitment, nobody help. <laughs> but yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, you're right. <laughs> Can, <laughs> 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 and that's not that we want to do. And that's not that we're simplified or trivialized. But, but, you know, I mean, there's no equivalent of gap. You know, generally accepted accounting principles or, or a fast or a top. And so you have to do it in your organization. But then you have to think about if you wanted to benchmark, and that's what some of the hardest part about those learning is what does it mean across organizations? What does that mean? What does that count mean? I love to two feedback so far. You guys cover the next 10 slides. This is going really well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you have something to say? I'm sorry. No, that was pretty much what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, uh, I know that any supply chain uh, issues that we have to have with the ERP or an MRP yeah. to understand what's coming in, what's going out, and yeah. how it's organized. But there are HR departments, recruitment departments that don't have to do this. I agree. So that's, I think. No, you're right. But I think part of it, like Jem said, is you need a first, it's not the system the problem, you need the process and the pressure mm -hmm. to drive the system, to drive the revenue and investment. I think sometimes we start with the system, you need to start first with the problem mm -hmm. and the challenge. I don't know, Kelly, you know I'm gonna call you out. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> What's your? Um, I think there's also the challenge in HR of the user of the system. So in finance, you have finance people, you have numbers people using a number system. So in terms of when they get the end to end of what happens to the data and what happens to you in zero or comma. In HR, you're taking HR people who are, you know, typically have not been data skilled people and you're trying to get them to understand that same management of data. So I think there's also a real challenge around that because the talent that you have managing the data isn't necessarily the way to which is why you know, it's such a big growth area for the HR function. But at, even as we grow the function, we're still operating in a community that isn't member centric, whereas finance, you're operating in a member centric community. You got it. I mean, that's why we have, I, I see people having, people more like Steve coming in the HR. I've seen more and more HR department literally hiring somebody from other department, another tech person, two, three person to build expertise. And you're right, people get intimidated by math, but you need to get in there. Look, I got to give you a quote. I know I'm, this is one of my favorite quotes. I have statistic background. Edward Deming. He's uh, one of the process engineers that the U.S. sent after the Second World War to Japan, to rebuild Japan. The lean development, he built a lot of process. He actually was a genius in process. He said when he got in Japan, everybody have an idea. He said everybody come and said, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. He said, I ended up telling everybody that come, I said I put a big uh, quote above my office. In God we trust, everybody else must bring data. So he said, I, I thought I got 90% of the idea. He said, I was getting so many ideas, I could not get any proof. And everybody wanted me to try. He's like, I didn't want to try anything because I have to rebuild the country. I had to be careful. And he said, literally, if you don't have evidence that this works somewhere else, I don't want to hear it. So I think the problem that we're having, we hear, you guys sort of cover it. A lot of time we hear client supply chain of talent. They're like, I can't hire, I can't do this, I can't do this. But what you're finding is, they will tell you there is skill gap. No, there is no skill gap. You actually have a process issue in your internally. You have location issue. You have awareness issue. You may have compensation issue. You have process issue, a competition. I start idea career builder for compensation data product. We started a compensation data analytics because of client. We had a client that posted a job. This is what we're dealing with. This is how we got into data business because of uh, James mentioned external pressure. 
I'm going to give you an example. This is how I started the whole idea. I had a client that posted a job for SAP Architect. Uh, how many of you are familiar with ERP, SAP? SAP, you guys know SAP. As soon as you hear the word SAP, that means a lot of money. <laughs> and you hear in IT, SAP Architect, that means about 75000 This client, the recruiter, the recruiter was hiring the position, and we kept sending him candidate. And he kept saying, career builder does not work. So one of the that I find out in my profile that I had a SAP experience at Honeywell, at Bell SAP, he called me out of the blue. He said, look, I keep sending this candidate, I'm screening myself to him. He kept saying, none of them work. He said, I saw you have SAP background. Can you get on the phone with me, with this client, to talk to him? I said, I'm not getting on the phone. Need you show me what candidate you send him? And look, we sent him 75. He was looking for SAP FICO, financial. We sent him 75 people that have financial background, SAP architect. And I look at the background, I'm like, well, I think you're right. I will get on the phone with you. So I was not in the even role. I was doing CRM. I was not getting the data business. So I get on the phone with this client. I said, look, I have SAP FICO experience. I look at these people. They all have experience. You said we're not sending you qualified people. He said, you don't understand. 90% of them are asking too much money. Because we ask him to define why you mean they're not qualified. <laughs> he said, I'm paying 55,000. All of them asking 75,000 and above. <laughs> he said they're unqualified. This is what we deal with. You guys don't realize it. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, well, yeah. That's what they call skill gap. People use the word skill gap. There is no many, there's not that much skill gap. It's actually hiring manager gap, there is salary gap. There is, that's what I'm learning over the years. It's not really a skill gap. People don't use the data. So I ended up telling him, look, um, this doesn't make sense. I bluntly told him, I'm like, I can do the analysis for your statistic. And he bluntly told me, look, I'm a recruiter. I don't know this. That's the budget I got. If you can help me, prove it to the comp team. Because there is always tension between the composition team and recruiter. He's like, I don't know this domain. We just implement SAP. Help me. I'm like, OK, this is better. Because we don't have. So what I did, I ran a query, and we have 20,000 SAP architect. I ran some simple statistic analysis for some time. I give them the data. I send them an Excel, and I say, look, 60% candidate I'm making between 75,000 and 120,000. You're paying 55,000, you're getting less than 1%. He sent me a feedback the next day. He's like, this is incredible value. I went far with the comp team. He, said, he sent me three, four positions. Can you put me the data? The next thing I know, because there is always a gap between a comp team and a hiring team, the recruiter. The next thing you know, that rep sent me 10 other clients. And then the next thing you know, three weeks later, I get 300 reps sent me an email saying, can you pull the data? And then the next thing you know, we have a portal. But it started with that pressure. This is to James Quinn, because we got that pressure. This is how we started. We started with a problem, probably. And I think a lot of time we start with the data, we try to use the data as a starting point. You usually start with what is the friction you have and you try to solve it. So you guys already said a slide, you mentioned it. I think in the 80s, I work in manufacturing, in the 90s, I work in manufacturing, I also work in CRM, and you can see all the solution integrated. Talent community, we were talking about it. The thing that I hear in HR now is always talent community and CRM. Look, I work with Salesforce CRM in 2000. I work with SAP CRM. I work with client five CRM. Most of the CRM, at best, you get 50% usage. And if we talk to every sales team, no matter what company you meet, CRM has been 20 years, what they do, they still use Excel for their contact refresh. And the primary reason you guys say that is not the system. It's a lot of companies build the system, they don't maintain the data quality. To your point, Steve. If you don't maintain the quality, it doesn't matter how cool is your system, what feature you have. I don't know why, I was gonna ask you, why everybody gets fixated on the next thing versus cleaning the data? It's not ex it's exciting. Yeah, you're right, that's what happened. I, I don't know what is it, I can't figure it out. Like you gotta clean the data, it doesn't matter because the salespeople know that, that's why they use Excel. And if you don't clean the system, the data, what happened? Your HR team people will recruit them start using Excel again. This is why a lot of ETS struggle. I don't know. This is why the system struggle. But to James' point, the reason why the financial system integrated ERP and logistics supply chain is because of the external pressure. They, they have to fix the system, they have to integrate it. And I think the other thing that I see, you guys mentioned that, is the system in HR are not as integrated like the other 
group. Salesforce has an ecosystem. SAP have an ecosystem. It's very integrated. So you guys already went through the list. System not integrated, data trap in silo, not complete picture, and a lack of external benchmark. Because if you cannot, you guys cover that. If you cannot cleanse the data, then you don't have external benchmark. So I'm gonna walk you through example that you guys already stated. So everybody knows sales is in demand. So what I typically get from a client, the VP of sales go to the CEO and said, I lost, I lost this person, this person, this person. We need to increase all the sales team race. The CEO is like, no, I don't believe that. So the CEO, this is a typical client scenario. The CEO called the VP of HR, he said, can you pull me some statistics on turnover? Because the VP of sales, you know what they do? They grab one or two person that they know, left, and then they, we should raise the money. The CEO told me, I got on the phone with the VP of HR, one CEO company. He said, if I listen to the VP of sales, uh, cost is going to go up by 50 million in the next month. I'm not doing that. So I want to ask you, this is like a little like client feedback. So now when you come to the VP of sales, come to you and say, we have high turnover. Everybody say that. You know, they don't have fights. High turnover, we need to fix the sales problem. What do you guys do? Before I show you what we did for these cases, what do you guys do? Because you all have this experience problem. In retail, Steve, when somebody said, we have experienced high turnover, what we'll 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 pull some trends, look at, you know, is it, is it a certain area of the country, is it a certain, you know, functional area, where, where is the issue? And then you know, work to address that. You know, it could be the fact that you're not bringing people, you're not providing opportunities, or what have you, but really just trying to find out, trying to you know, narrow it down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What else? CVS, I'm looking at. Where do you guys have I know, I know she was hiding, I'm looking at her. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, we look at, we look at our turnover and you're, you're trying to kind of narrow it down and, and yeah. you know, hopefully we're trying to find the right setup, but a lot of it is we're just trying to narrow it down because we're the ones that kind of, we want them to close the back door because we keep trying to oversell why the door is open in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we're really pushing HR to say it, it's, it's important to understand the factors. And comp is always the first and easiest and most anecdotal to say because you more money out it you can find places to work. You're right. And that's when, again, more specific, hyper focus in that case, instead of listening to the VP of sales who said, I know so, so, so left. Prove me to me. That's what I hear. Is this familiar scenario you guys learned to? So let me walk you through a little bit while you guys are eating the scenario. So the demand for sales went up by 40% in the past 12 months. This is why a lot of you experienced across the board. Um, so you can hear the highest position to fill this year, the last three months, is sales. You can type articles, you will find it. The whole story. So what we did for this client, the main, but like you guys just said, this client was smart. He said, I don't believe the VP of sales because he just knows so, so we just need to do benchmark. They did their own internal benchmark. Then they asked me to pull out external benchmark by industry, by location, by size. So what we did, we grabbed all the resume. We have 96 mil million resume past five years. We grabbed all of them. And then I grabbed by industry in that location. Then I see the tenure. You follow me because I have the resume history in that specific location, in that specific industry. What it turned out to be, his turnover was below the 25 percentile in that industry. Guess what? The CEO told us, the VP of talent, we are not increasing $50 million salary. What we have is normal in this trend. Is that making sense or no? The economy is recovered. And you know what the economy is recovered? You all can experiment turnover. And to your point, you should not throw money at it because guess what? Everybody is famous in that area. I think it's just an easy reaction. To everybody want to throw salary. It's just a first thing instant. Just throw more money at it. Did you benchmark it? So whenever we do benchmark, sample size, we're finding that you actually, what we're finding, typical client, when I do the studies, I may tell you the thing that I find, 90% of the studies, you're never as good as you think you are. You're never as bad as you think you are. 
I can summarize it to you guys. Most of the study is always. And usually, uh, like Kelly said, the HR person told me, I know. I just want you to create a report. I told you so. She, she called that report. I told you so. So, so I'm going to quickly introduce you Brad Bain. Why we acquire Brad Bain? Um, one reason why I acquire Brad Bain because we have someone like you guys. You know, all the integration data gap. Uh, Debbie, should I wait for five minutes or let them eat, maybe? What do you guys think? Should I keep going? <laughs> should I keep going or let you guys eat the place? I I'll let you guys eat. Keep, keep going. Okay, all right. I, I, I don't feel better. <laughs> so, Brad Bean, the reason why I require Brad Bean. He just wants to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm okay. I have a long breath, uh, late breakfast in the hotel. I got lost in the hotel. I have a late breakfast. <laughs> so, why we acquire Brad Bean? Because the middle one. Everything that we discussed about uh, HR, the lack of integration efficiency, and then we, I was presenting to client where we were heading career builder here in the US. Some client kept telling me, look, what do you just say where you're heading? We try to build an ecosystem. We want to build an open ecosystem. They're like, it's funny you're telling me this. Somebody from Brad Bean Kelly just left an hour ago and he told me the same thing. So I went to UK, talked to the UK client, what's your biggest pain point? Because we are shifting career builder to start with your pain point. And they tell me the same thing like you guys tell me, data cleansing, help us clean the data, help us do integration, add external benchmark. And every time I talk to a client in UK, they're like, I think somebody from Brad Bean just left and mentioned the same thing. I went to Singapore, guess what? I got the same feedback. I want to see them, like we got to acquire them because they had the same vision. They already have the product, I'm going to walk you through. You know, not 80% of the merger fail, a lot of merger acquisition fail because people start to do financial aid. It's actually, you should try to solve the same problem, the same integration. So they build an ecosystem that is very open. So, and the thing that he was using, this is his presentation, before I just came present to the client, is we want to solve your friction. What we want to solve in HR? Improve the efficiency of the recruiter. Same thing we are trying to do for you guys. The workflow, we talked about it with uh, Kelly. The workflow is not building a big system. Keep it simple, integrated. And then source tracking and reporting. This is the biggest pain that we see in recruitment. A lot of you, I try to integrate different source, find out what's my best source, how much I'm spending in recruitment. And this is all the thing that we've been hearing. We were gonna build a solution. Guess what, but I've been building. And they were ask, they were having the same conversation, so we end up acquiring them. And I'm going to introduce you, manage response and communication. This is what Kelly and I were talking about CRM. Instead of building CRM, deep CRM, keep it simple. Just manage that communication and response. And here is the CEO. Some of you met him. I love Kelly. Uh, we, when we met the first time, we were evaluating for acquisition. He told me, I'm gonna set your expectation. I'm terrible at golf. I'm like, I'm terrible at golf too. That's why we signed the deal. <laughs> we were both big holes, but he's, uh, he had his, I call it the Queen English. He's from England. So in the acquisition process, I said, I gotta meet your wife. He said, why? I said, because she's your real boss. I gotta meet your real boss to hear your feedback. <laughs> no, I met his family out of Newport Beach. It's been incredible acquisition. It's one of the easiest acquisitions we have done. And they're very, uh, He's had a technology background, and we have integrated very fast. And Kelly, you met him. You can give feedback. He's very easy going. Some of you have met him. He's probably one of the most easy going person you can get. And he's very driven. All you want to hear is a pinpoint purple. I don't know, Debbie and Kelly, who, who you guys met him often. What's your feedback? Can I just like, to What, a British accent? You like the British <laughs> English accent? <laughs> <laughs> that queer English? <laughs> uh, but no, I think one of the And then basically what they enable us to get is serve 65 country instantly and have job distribution. So the middleware, they can help you with tracking. And also what you guys ask us, if we build software, you want to be able to use a competitor. But I've been having integration with 6,000 job board. So I can ask career builder, we're moving to a, 
a recruitment platform. We're not going to just be advertising. We try to be in a recruitment platform. We want to consolidate the data and let you use whatever plugin pain point you have. And by the way, everything that I just told you about your challenge you have in internally, you know how we said silo product, the database is multiple, you can get a picture. By the way, Career Builder is going through the same thing internally. So I'm going to share with you guys some internal things that I'm trying to fix internally. I'm leading those projects. We had, I said earlier, we have 96 million resume for the past 10, 15 years. We have millions of resume. Guess what we did? Mistake. Like all of you, we had more than 15 databases that the recruiter access. And each of the database had a specialized, we created a lot of niche site. We created social media, as I said, we have um, work retail, we had, you name it. We have niche site after niche site. What we did, we didn't consolidate the data. We instead let for every niche site to have their own database, their own process. So we have solo gig, we have, you cannot believe how much data we have. So as a result, most of a client cannot access it. The sales team can access it. CVS will love nurse practitioner. You know, nurse practitioner is in demand in healthcare. Everybody loves nurse practitioner. So if you go to a database, you will find 10,000 nurse practitioners. You go to LinkedIn, you may find 13,000 nurse practitioners. But guess what? We have 43,000. 73% want to be private. Nobody have access to them. We try to expose more our data. So I'm going to walk you through an example where LinkedIn did a better job. Some of you are using LinkedIn. So if you go to LinkedIn, they had one global search. We are creating one global search for all the data. So uh, Kelly, you said you use sometimes LinkedIn for to find the supply. Do you have an alarm? No. <laughs> is it me? Is it me? I was wondering if it was my phone. <laughs> is, it, is it still going on? <laughs> That's why I was getting louder. <laughs> but if you you use LinkedIn sometimes for supply and demand. You said you use it. So let's say I do Java developer, I can do server position. What LinkedIn did, they have one database and they put 15 years of data. It could be duplication, doesn't matter. So look at a zip code, Kelly, this is, I just did that for you. And I put 50 maps, okay, within Chicago, 50 maps. They have 12,000. When I do in our resume database, all resume, we have 25,000. We limit it instead to three months. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna consolidate all our database, show you all the data you have access to. And we're getting data from so social media, we're gonna refresh our data. But we are running into the same challenge we did, like you guys. Now, based on your feedback, you're one of them. We said, you have too many databases, just create one search. And look, internally, when I was pushing that one search, you guys are gonna have the same challenge. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna share my experience. When I said we should consolidate our data into one source, every product manager, every team that silo, as you guys sound familiar, was a resistor. Does that sound familiar? Everybody say, why do you want to do that? This is too complex project. Let me give you tips that I told them. Now shut up, everybody. I got them in the room. They were like, we should not do this project. It's too complex. Guess what? Everybody's singing in their silo. I'm like, the recruiter just won one box. You guys are telling me they're singing in their own silo. You know what I told them? Google put the whole world information in one box. The whole world information. We can put all our resume in one box. I think that's stop, everybody stop arguing. <laughs> but I think what happened is you have the same thing internally. You have so many databases. People, everybody, every major company have so many databases. So I'm going to ask you, how are you are consolidating the data? How are you convincing the group, the different group to work together internally? Nobody want to speak about it. James, go ahead. We want to everybody lower their head. Go ahead. You know, it's going to be weird. That was a, that was a conversation of a decade. <laughs> So about 10 years ago, Bill Connolly was the head of HRG before my time and had a vision for a single Oracle instance. We have the second largest Oracle instance yeah. behind the US Army. Yeah. And we have about 14 years worth of people data consolidated across all of our platforms into one business intelligence platform. So we're about to change how the technology or what, how it gets delivered to the end user. But it's a very different journey than the two <coughs> previous jobs I had in workforce planning and analytics where they were very disparate. The advantage of the CIO though is very interesting. 
because we're starting to look at the sort of characteristics of people that we see in their application process in their first year, second year, and third year success that we could only see if we had the data from the recruitment process and the data about their performance and their raises all in one single place without having to you know, try to merge the data and figure out what it's going to be. So, you know, it's, it's kind of strange because we, the, the one weird thing about the company that you may not know is you know, we're very, it's a uh, conglomerate model. Yeah. The only place where there's a single global instance of anything of this type is in HR. So wow. Does not have wow. That is so it's always a, a crazy conversation where you're like, you know, yeah, we, we can just do that in 10 minutes. You, know? you want to know that? No. So we own headcount. Got it. Right? So, so, so basically, you guys achieved this. Measure equipment integrated, business analytics done, and predictive. You guys achieved yeah, that type no, of thing? No, we're not in the predictive thing. We're still trying to figure some of that stuff out. The hardest part for us is, is the question we want to ask. We have the capability of answering a lot of questions, but what do we really want to know? What is it that the company will know that will make a difference for the operations, for the employee base? Uh, and you're right. And that's, you know, when I, I kind of hear me say that when I spoke at a data company, Everybody tell me, come talk about big data. And the first slide I put in, is not about big data, it's about a big question and a big answer. Yep. They're like, well, we brought you for big data. I'm like, I know we brought you for big data for this big, but I'm telling you, I've been doing big data for 10, 20 years. It's about a big question and a big answer. People don't care, your, your stakeholders internally don't care what data you have. All you want to know, can you answer that question? But and that's I think the harder part is sometimes coaching people on what question they should ask you, because sometimes they don't know what to ask you. So that's the hardest part. So sometimes you talk about a thing, you periodically just throw out something, and it's not necessarily so that you know, that people actually react to the actual thing that you've thrown out. It is to get them to start thinking differently about what questions they could ask of us that we could, we could answer to support the business. So it's a little bit different model than but that will be a great topic for the panel discussion. That is where everybody want to ask. <laughs> yes, that is, I think that's what, I think the, what are you hearing is the recurring team. How you integrate the data, how you refresh it, how do you, once you have integrated like James says, what do you do with it? That is a great transition. Thank you. And now I'm gonna go eat, thank you. <laughs> So thank you, Abdel, for kind of kicking us off, and I'll have the three panelists come up. And I love that we kept this kind of open discussion anyway, so now we'll keep it kind of open discussion. We have these three beautiful seats for you guys. It's kind of tight quarters in this little table, but get comfy cozy. <laughs> <laughs> you can spread it out or you know. Yeah. Oh, got it. Sorry. Okay. We're taking our shoes off so you guys get to. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly was very excited about the front. I think James, it would be good. Everybody wanna hear transition actually. How we're gonna introduce them. Yeah, and then how did you go how did you go so they did the data? The question I have for everybody. Would you like to run it? No, no, you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Nah, do we keep me up here for this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. You guys are going to have it. Are we going to dessert up here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. That's the most important oh, question. That's the big question. And we yeah, have yeah, 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 a big answer. The big question is... <laughs> Yeah. It, would, it would be helpful to me a little bit. Who in the room does talent management? Just as a quick question. Is there anybody here who's sort of like doing talent management work or HR generalist work? Is most of the room recruiting? Raise your, so we've got two over here. Raise your hand up. Okay. At least um, that are doing talent management and okay. analytics. You guys are doing some talent management? Okay. Yeah. Over here. Sure. All right. Perfect. And then our hair. So we've got. Yeah. 
Um, and so we, before we get started, I think it would be helpful, we've all kind of been talking, um, and we actually do have a, a small group, so I do think it would be helpful, um, I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves here in just a minute, but if you guys don't mind, since we are kind of a smaller group, if you guys don't mind introducing yourselves and, um, and kind of your function real quick, and I think that will kind of help play into that. So Steve, if you want to start. Yeah, so Steve is in the TJX companies. Uh, I've, I've been at TJX for less than a year. Um, so my background is before really from the state, so retail, but more forecasting, analytics, and finance. Um, so basically what TJX has done the last year or so is we're doing kind of, kind of transformed HR. So we have these centers of excellence, right? So we have a global talent management team and talent acquisition. We're workforce planning and analytics. Um, so really we're kind of like the uh, the experts, I guess, with the data analytics support of those other groups, you know, so we'll work with the team <coughs> uh, providing around talent reviews, talent gaps, uh, you know, for talent acquisition, uh, same thing, you know, kind of looking at what, what the need's going to be down the road based on historical trends and term, terminations and all those types of things, uh, versus, okay, what, what's our current pool of people, uh, right, so that's more the talent management side, how do you develop those people to fill the that are going to be open, and then, What's the gap and then so PA comes into play, so like how you can fill those roles externally. So, um, so we're kind of developing this, so we're just started our journey basically, you know, we haven't figured it out yet, um, but we're getting there. And again, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're again, providing a lot of data analytics and insights. And, and to your point about what question do you ask, and, and we're working with the HR business partners to try to figure out what do they want to know and what are those questions. Place there, so but uh, yeah, so we got a ways to go. Great, we'll just move right around the table. <laughs> so, um, Mike Capasso, I'm at Liberty Mutual. I've been there for about three months, which have actually been my first three months in the talent acquisition space, so it's been interesting. Uh, prior to that, I was in digital analytics and optimization at Adobe, so I really was brought on. Look. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I was brought on to, to the team to really help sort of shore up a lot of things in our data management. So we're really making a push, it sounds like we're a little behind TDX, but are trying to go down that road, specifically in terms of sort of source attribution and hiring attribution, things like that. So uh, I'm really just here to kind of take it all in, and so far it's been really interesting because it's great to know that we are not the only ones facing these same problems, and they're kind of industry-wide. Go back here to the to the back. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah Thompson. I'm an internal sourcer for Edna. I'm a talent acquisition. I have a come from a staffing background. So just recently been at Edna for about two months now. Great. From the source of my fabulous. Great. Adrian Thompson. Um, I'm with the Hartford Financial Services Company. I've been there for seven years. I lead um, talent acquisition. IT operations and our personal insurance business. Um, so my team is kind of across the country and we do all of the professional as well as the executive recruiting for the firm. A lot. Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon Sunflet. I'm with Ethan Allen Global. And I'm a generalist, a recruiter, uh, wow. <laughs> talent acquisition trainer. Uh, I've been in HR for quite some time. I'll drink 25 years and stuff there. Uh, but I've sort of seen it, uh, it's seen the talent acquisition, uh, you know, progress over the years. And I think what uh, at Ethan Allen, we are doing a lot with three people who are primarily generalists. And uh, so recruiting isn't, uh, we don't have a separate recruiting department. It's Lori and I and, and my boss. And so we're, but we are sourcing all across the country uh, for all types of positions and internationally and recently. So uh, just sort of taking it all in, we've had a great partnership with Career Builder. We're trying to figure out all of your wonderful um, reports. So we're still figuring out the questions that your reports may be answering. <laughs> 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 so we're <laughs> I'm Lori Julie. I work with Sharon and Ethan Allen, um, and I'm helping with the recruiting. Great. Anyone else want to come? 
Yeah, I'm Chris Palmer uh, with Alston in the U.S. and here. <coughs> I'm head of HR, so I do everything. Uh, but my, I think my interest really is going on the talent side and the recruiting side. Um, and it's interesting, I'm going to have uh, a relationship with all three companies, CES and uh, Fidelity, pretty broad customer, and GE, and they're actually in the process of selling us. We're a competitor with the uh, human process. So Welcome. We're going to well. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're excited we to have you. <laughs> but, uh, but it is a dream. We've got to I mean, we do look for talent in the same, same place and the same kind of scale. So, uh, but, you know, and also just trying to interest you know, what we've got to do. We keep the team in the place. Great. Hi, I'm Cheryl Dell. I work with Aetna. I'm in just ended up in, in town and position for a number of years, so I don't give my age now. But um, <laughs> uh, it's just fascinating to see how uh, career field has changed over the years. So I just wanted to see you know, what you're doing and what you're doing as far as the future and how it can be a value add for Edna. We really struggle with more of our um, C level, our, our executives, like really trying to not utilize um, headhunters uh, to fill those positions. So, what Adam utilized to do that, and um, I think that's a, a big issue for us. And we, we've been acquiring a number of contracts throughout the U.S. in the, in, you know, the healthcare space of Medicaid, so we're really growing and losing bound. And um, so we've had some challenges to really try to fill positions within a, a timely manner, um, and um, you know, with top talent. So that's been our challenge, but it's every day is something new. And then I brought a dime with me been assisting and, and helping out. She wants to know more about um, uh, human resources, so I thought this was a good form for her to um, uh, learn more as well. And she just graduated from Fairfield University, so she doesn't really know what she wants to do, so she's really trying to, to well, stay. And I know analytics is really big. So, just awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, guys. And we'll have the panel go ahead, if you guys don't mind introducing yourselves, um, your function, and, um, and then we'll go from there. Sure, Jennifer Lindsay. I'm with uh, CBS Caremark. I'm a director of talent acquisition there. I've been there for 13 years. Um, we really are a series of mergers. So every two years, we are reinventing ourselves and redefining who talent acquisition is, our client base, and um, restructuring how we support a larger and larger organization. So I actually have operations. So I used to be over talent delivery. Um, I now we took a different route and I now manage our advertising and branding, career site, um, all of our tools and resources. Um, we have corporate relocation, university relations, and then temp labor. And then I have the um, pleasure of also managing the TA budget. So all of those have a very symbiotic relationship because our talent delivery team who's looking for talent relies on us to help identify those tools and resources and do it effectively, track it, and use our money wisely. Um, and that has a ter terrific impact on how my reload dollars are leveraged, if I leverage um, temp labor, and if we end up tapping into university relations. And am I supposed to start the dance? <laughs> 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 Super. Okay. Do you travel with your own soundtrack? I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is your five the minute slide break. shows the movement. <laughs> <laughs> They're backup dancers, so this is one of the so to you, <laughs> I wish I brought back of dancers. Um, my name is Kelly Thompson. I'm at Fidelity Investments, um, a VP of Enterprise Talent Marketing and Fidelity. And um, my team and I work on uh, employment branding, recruitment marketing, um, vendor management, and product innovation um, as it relates to talent acquisition and talent development. Um, labor market research, uh, which is where we are um, avid users of MZ and the supply and demand portal. Um, and then the social recruiting strategy for the firm. So um, I set up a boss at a down this morning and uh, we're looking forward to talking a little bit. Okay. She's very humble. She's got a big promotion. So let's give her a big round. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good afternoon. I'm, I'm James Dahlman. I'm GE's leader for strategic workforce planning. Um, I joined GE about two and a half years ago. And um, wow, I, I'm feeling a little bit odd because I don't really do recruiting. Um, I talk to them a lot, 
Um, but I don't really do that, you know, the, recru the recruiters, I, uh, <laughs> I'm doing some recruiting myself these days and figuring out how to do that. But so I think my space that I'm going to really be able to address pretty well for you today might be a little bit more on the talent management area, but we'll work it out. Um, I always like to preface this, anything that I say by saying, um, the GE that you think you know, you probably don't. Uh, some things we don't do anymore. We do not do the 70-20-10 thing. It's not happening anymore. It has not happened for a decade. <laughs> the moving every 12 to 18 months, unless you are a junior professional on one of our career accelerator programs, that also does not happen. Jack Welch is no longer chairman of GE. <laughs> Jack Welch has been away from GE for more than 14 years, I believe. Does he know? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes some of our, our uh, people in the press don't quite know. So that's sometimes a little bit of a, a messaging challenge that we have about the company. So, you know, it, it's a company that's under tremendous amount of transformation. You've probably heard and heard in the room. We, we make a lot of acquisitions, so we change the portfolio a lot. It's a very low turnover organization, except for the fact that we are buying businesses and sometimes disposing of businesses. So. When I talk about it, a little bit of what I can talk about will be some of that about acquisition, acquisition integration, what it means for us, some data around that, and also what it means about uh, people who return, so we've done some analysis around that. But not necessarily maybe some of the more standard data integration challenges around recruiting. So I'll do the best I can, but might not be able to help you out. And I actually think that's a great place to start because I think many of the people in the room, we've seen an, a large shift in, um, in HR in general going towards um, more of the workforce planning functionality. But because it is new, it is, um, it's a late adoption for many companies and they're still trying to figure out how to do it. So I think a lot of the people here in the room are very interested to see what made that shift for GE and what does your team do? Okay, so, um, you know, as I said earlier, GE's been on about a 12 to 13 year journey around data integration, getting a single global instance of Oracle, a BI platform. And so if you think about it at the very beginning, that was where they started, where the company started. What happened next was bolt-on tools. So bolt-on tools for talent management, performance development, uh, organizational sort of analysis, succession planning. Those are the tools that kind of got brought in next. After a while you say, how do we really maximize the value of all of this data? And started the company started in, I think, about 2008 or 9, doing some experiments in workforce planning. Now, we already had an HR analytics platform that had been rolling for some time, and it was really more of a reporting toolkit, less sort of analytics, if you want to think of that as the next layer up. So not just generating a list, but starting to show you data, show you context, trend analysis and the like, and maybe even some forward projection. So in about 2009, GE decided to start hiring workforce planners. And the first workforce planning work in GE actually happened in what was the energy business, which has now been divided into three parts. Um, subsequently hired people in the healthcare business, capital, aviation. So we're getting workforce planners into all of our businesses, but haven't quite done that yet. And then at corporate, my role is really to be the community facilitator of the workforce planners to make sure that they have the right tools, the right infrastructure for doing their work, but also to act as a sounding board for ideas that they may have to connect them across the landscape of what the company does. Um, we actually separate our workforce planning and our reporting and analytics teams. And the reason why we do that is to separate the operational activity from the strategic activity, because that reporting and analytics team has to just feel so many responses about headcount. If you look at what they do, still about a third of our requests that we get in that team, it's really just about headcount reporting. How many people have worked in this? And let me slice it a different way. And even though we have this online tool to deliver it, we still struggle with you know getting people to use it, adoption, getting people to actually then get the data, so, so we're still working through that. So the workforce planners, we separate out, and we actually align them up into their businesses. And the reason for that is, we don't want for this work, which needs to be about 
the alignment of human capital allocation with financial capital allocation and business strategy for there to be a separation of the people from the business. So we don't want it to be, hi, I'm here from corporate and I'm here to help. It should be I'm a part of your business, or at least that's how GE runs. So we have people in our energy business or in our energy businesses who do workforce planning. Now I'll tell you some numbers because you probably want to know it. We're about 30 people that do workforce planning and analytics at GE. We support 300,000 people, hopefully soon to be about 370,000 when we get all of um, We will do that in about, you know, I mean, we have people in 120 countries around the world. So it's, it's a beast of a thing to look at. That's why we have such a large team, but also because we own headcount. So imagine that we have to just do a lot of the reporting on that to talk to the finance organization generating reporting that's about that. So that's why we're about 30 people. For advanced analytics, I would say that we probably have about maybe eight people who do that with some people with a couple folks who have some really strong machine learning, statistical backgrounds, and really doing some of the deeper work that we need to do. Um, and then a few of us who are just data dilettante step in every once in a while and can at least offer some suggestions for what needs to be done before they tell us, no, nah, you shouldn't analyze it that way. So that's kind of the structure of what we do and, and why we do it that way. Um, it works for us. I'm not saying it's the right structure for any of you. I'll tell you the, where, where we get help. We get help from our, some of our pricing analytics team when we have certain techniques that we don't know on our team. We get help from our web marketing and trends team. They support us at times. Uh, we also have a strong audit analytics team in our finance organization. We use them. Because of our research background, we have the GE Research Center up in Miskiuna, but also sites globally that have very strong machine learning people. And we leverage sometimes either those people to help with an analysis or those people to tell us this is the analytical technique that would be best used to solve this problem. So not all of it's even encapsulated in the HR team, just because we recognize we don't really have that skill or capability amongst us. So hopefully that helps at least answer you know, some of the structure in question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would kind of layer on top of that, you know, our relationship with you and your team actually started because of an acquisition that we made when we acquired MZ. Um, for those who are not familiar with MZ, MZ stands for Economic Modeling Specialists, Inc. Uh, they are similar backgrounds to what you just mentioned. A lot of statisticians and economists that do a lot of crunching of data and understanding what are the trends and then how do we make projections. Um, how does your team leverage that tool and tools like that to help in that decision making? So we're always trying to make as a company decisions about where should work be done. Uh, we try to evaluate labor markets for things like, we, you may have seen we announced a, a technology center in Oklahoma City, or we announced a shared services center in Cincinnati. Whenever we look at those places, we're looking at what's the right mix between where we have scale as a company, because that's a very important thing for us. We're trying to do a lot of footprint consolidation to get not so many sites. So we're trying to get people into bigger locations for a variety of reasons. Actually, that's a very interesting analysis that I can tell you about later. Um, but at the same time, we want to use data to support our recruiters, and that's where I say I do talk to them at times. So what are we looking at? If you just look at a labor market, we're looking at sort of like a life or expected life of GE in the market. Now, we don't really think this is really going to happen, but think about it this way. If you look at a box, and it's this high of all the possible range of people and salaries that you have, and you choose a salary level that you'd like to per perhaps participate at, you have something that's left. We then look at that and say, what do we expect in this population would be our turnover rate? And then if we use that, we say, well then, this is the consumed life of what's in that market. Now, of course, the market's going to grow. We're probably not going to actually go through everyone. Some people will return. But that's part of the way that we evaluate the market. We're also evaluating it on what's our scale there, um, 
what are other factors that are there, what's the tax rate locally, what's the capital investment we need to put into play. But that labor market component is a very integral component of the decision that we make about where we want to place work. And especially incremental new work, so if we're building a new facility. Okay, great. And Kelly, I'll kind of segue over to you. You started with us in a very different life cycle um, prior to the acquisition of MZ. Can you share with the group kind of what your journey has been? And if you can't tell already, um, she sits on the board that Abdel has that kind of consults with our, um, our intelligence teams of what should we be doing with our products and how should we be developing them. So would you share kind of that life cycle with your group? Sort of happy to. Um, so I joined Fidelity about, just about three years ago, I've been celebrating my three year anniversary, um, <clears throat> about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago. And so <clears throat> I always joke that I have about seven more years until I'm not new anymore. Um, <laughs> we have very long longevity in our employees. They stay with us for very long periods of time. So um, I always joke that I've got a little while longer before I'm not new. Um, when I joined, I was brought on board uh, specifically to focus on social recruiting. So it was to come on board and come up with a social recruiting strategy for the firm. Um, about three weeks after I joined, someone came to me and they said, we needed to do some labor market research, so we hired a, a vendor to do it for us. And this is the report they did, and we're not really sure whether we like it or not. Can you read it and tell us what you think? So I made what is a colossal either opportunity or mistake, depending on your perspective. I read the report and I gave my opinion. So subsequently, and then I was not just social recruiting, but I was not social recruiting and labor market research. <laughs> um, so what I did was I had to, um, I took the report that they had done on one of our locations, that happened to be Dallas, um, and I kind of did my own shadow report. I said, you know, the problems I had with the report they did were not, um, it was not the data they used or the validity of the report, it was that they, because it was an external party, they didn't make certain assumptions and they weren't willing to take certain risks in what they included. And so it was a very um, cut and dry kind of report. So what I did in doing, doing that first report that I did was I would look at things like in Dallas, um, we knew that there was a major construction project going on in Dallas, the highways, similar to what we experienced in Boston with the big dig, where they were expanding north of the airport. And it was creating a huge problem for people commuting and people were literally having, people who had 15 minute commutes now had 45 minutes to an hour commutes to get to their job. And if you know the Dallas area, which I know that you do, live there, one thing that you'll know <laughs> is that people in Dallas um, will drive five hours for a high school football game, but they won't drive more than a half an hour for work. It's just, it's not, it's not a good commuting culture um, in the Dallas area. I mean, they will, they end up sitting in traffic because there's quite a bit of traffic down there. But um, in the Northeast, for those of you from the Northeast, and you, you know this, you know, if your commute's less than an hour, nobody's giving you any pity at all. It's almost a badge of honor, you know. I'm like, that's an hour and 45 minutes. Um, must be very proud. <laughs> so it's, it's something that, you know, looking at that highway infrastructure project and then looking at other data sources and finding out the average commute time was 20 minutes in the region, and then looking at our own internal data and seeing, you know, X percentage of our employees, I, 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 I think I wiped the number from my mind, but it was a, a very high percentage of our employees live within seven miles of the office. We very quickly realized in doing that research that there was a line through Dallas, and everybody to the right of it was most likely not going to consider opportunities, at least for the next 18 months to 24 months until that project was done. And it's still not done. <laughs> it's going to be lovely. <laughs> I spend time on the it's website so and it's going to be beautiful. And I just keep reminding my colleagues down in Dallas, you know, Boston, it was a rough 10 or 12 years. But it's really nice in downtown Boston now. Yeah. It's a great park, that ugly highway's gone. You just got to stick it out. Um, but some of those, you know, some of that stuff I found through a Google search. Just Google in Dallas and I stumbled on the highway infrastructure project. And then I would talk to some of our folks that live there and they would tell me about what they did in their free time and how they got to work. and. Um, so the external source that we were working with just didn't have, either didn't have access to some of that data or weren't willing to kind of take some of those risks and what they were willing to include back in their reporting. So the interesting thing about that first report was it took me about, I want to say three weeks, because in that I, I included all the kind of anecdotal, ancillary data. Um, <clears throat> but I also needed to show them what was the demand in the marketplace for the jobs and what was the supply. 
And so I spent almost a week searching the internet trying to find out who was posting jobs, how many, all of our list of 20 competitors, what were they doing, and I'm Googling around and doing this, and after the first week I went into my boss and I said, I know Career Builder has a product that does this, and I just spent a week of my life, and I don't want to lose another nine weeks because we have nine other large regional centers that are probably going to come and ask me to do a similar analysis as soon as they see this one. Um, so that was how I first started um, working with the supply and demand portal. And, you know, legitimately, a week of time searching the internet to get the jobs versus putting in the criteria, hitting the button, and then just seeing there's a thousand jobs in the, you know, 35 mile radius, and here's the 10 companies that you're competing with. That was, you know, game changing mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I could then spend my time on providing, which was digging even deeper into some of our own internal data around, you know, where do people live? Where do the people that have been here the longest live? Um, do we see shifts in commuting patterns when we have other people that come to that site from other locations? So it was um, that was a big shift for us. And we did, and no surprise, I did end up doing nine other reports. Um, and it grew over time. So we started doing more and more of those reports and refreshing them. And ultimately, um, this year I was able to get a full-time resource so that I could get out of the business of doing those reports. Um, but also so that we could expand uh, the next level of our service offering. So what we did with these large regional reports is we made them available to all of our HR business partners. Um, we made it available to hiring managers, to recruiters. And the reason it's so critical is, is something that you mentioned around, you know, where does the work get done? Because we have large regional centers, we might have a hiring manager that sits in Denver and his team is in Boston, Florida, and Texas. Um, he may not have a lot of deep knowledge in Florida or Texas. So this, these reports help him understand not just the environment he's gonna hire in when he grows his team there, but the environment that his current team is working in so that he gets a little better understanding of, of what the characteristics are of that, of that environment. Um, and it's also instrumental in helping you know recruiters if we have a, a manager who's got a team in Denver, in Florida, um, and they have to grow their team, how does Denver and Florida stack up in terms of that particular job function if I'm hiring Java developers, you know, do I want to go to, do I want to grow that team in Dallas or do I want to grow it in New Hampshire? Which one looks more advantageous? So that's where we started to get to. Um, and then as we, we um, as Career Builder um, acquired MZ, we started looking at MZ in more that forward looking. So supply and demand we're using more for that um, historic and current. And then MZ we're looking more forward thinking and we're starting to look at things like college degrees, you know, how does that impact? Um, technology hiring. So we're a financial services firm, but we've got over 12,000 IT professionals. So I often jokingly say, we're an IT firm that does financial services. <laughs> um, so that's a very important component for us when we think about talent and understanding the pipeline from the universities and understanding the, the different markets and how that plays in the competition has been very critical for us. So can I ask? Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever considered doing a a different kind of reload strategy. So thinking about the fact that sometimes you, there are just barriers, you know, I mean, there's, what is it, 50 miles now is you don't do reload, or the IRS gives you a hard time if it's less than 50 miles. Yep. But have you ever thought about biting the bullet and just saying, if you take the job, we will reload you across town? For certain skill areas, we wouldn't do it for everyone in certain markets, I'm just curious if, if anybody thought about that at all? trying to use data to say, look, if no one commutes more than two, because for voluntary quit rate, has anyone ever looked at voluntary quit rate by distance from your location? Because it's a, sorry. Uh, well, I've worked with clients where the exact same thing's happening here. They don't have the budget to reload long yeah. distance, so we propose that they put Skype, we call it a Skype event, with, yeah, to, to move closer because you're right, it's a, you don't want to live there more than 35 miles away from, from your office. And some clients have been really perceptive that they have a fine budget for a segment. Um, some clients, it's just due to not wanting to do it in one location and then doing it in other locations that open up, it opens up a new can of corn. So, I will tell you a good example of that. Um, of that. So I did that research on Dallas, publicized it everywhere, and you know that when your research is really taken off, is when other people start quoting it back to you. Yes. So I had a meeting and someone said, did you know in Dallas they'll drive five hours for a football game? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, that's so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually, 
after I did that report, about three months later, I went down to Dallas to visit our site, and I went to a career event that, that was happening locally. And so our recruiters are with the table. I'm kind of hanging out, just listening. Just like you, I don't recruit. I don't have recruiters on my team, but I do hang out with them a lot. And I hear one of our recruiters having a conversation with this candidate. It's a great conversation. The candidate's got great skills. I can tell the recruiter's getting excited. And the candidate says, where are you located? And they say, oh, you know, our office is in Westlake. And the candidate says, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to work for me. And it was like, you could just hear the air being sucked out of the room. <laughs> the recruiter said, just oh, gutted. And the recruiter said, oh, why not? And they said, well, you know, well, I'm in grapevine. And it's, you know, for the Northeast, I mean, the equivalent would be, you know, I'm in Stanford and I live in Bridgeport. You know, it's, 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 it's not that far. I mean, logistically, as the crow flies, it's like probably 30 miles. Um, but it was all I could do not to jump up and down to see, I knew, I knew, I knew. I knew. <laughs> um, they're on the other side of the line. It's just, they're, they're, and they are, they're on the other side of the line. I was all excited. Um, and then the candidate said, well, I would consider it if you guys maybe might be able to think about how they can your love. And I just remember being completely blown away that somebody would, who lived 30 miles away would sell their house, uproot their family, <laughs> rather than, than drive. But it really is about the, the perception and, and the, the characteristics of the market. And that kind of, that little moment really hooked me on this work, um, even though I don't do it day to day anymore because I have someone that's doing a lot of that. The power of what it can do in educating it and changing the conversation between recruiting and hiring managers, um, I think it's really, you know, really valuable. Uh, really valuable. I, I would compliment that. I think you know, we've been using the data um, with recruiters to have those discussions with hiring leaders to say, I'm coming to you with credible information. It's not just anecdotal. It's not just hearsay. I've got data that tells me this is where these people are in the marketplace. Here's where they are for a compensation. Here's where your competition is. Here's how we're stacking up against that competition. Now, how do we go solve this problem together? Because it is a it is a collaboration. Because you are going to need to flex. Because you're not going to get um, the quality that you're looking for at the rate that you want to pay. And by the way, nobody wants to be here just in Woonsocket or just in Dallas, Texas. And so part of where we. Um, looked at the model and the data is not only as a way for our recruiters to come to the table in a consultative manner, but with ideas and recommendations that say, if the labor's not sitting in the locations that we're officing in, we have the luxury of multiple other corporate office locations, but where do we stretch and push our culture that says, we don't necessarily have to bring the labor to us, where do we get smart? and flex our needs to say, where do we need to consider telecommuting? Where do we need to consider labor that's sitting outside of your team? And that's a real push, not only culturally, but um, both virtual leadership is a challenge, accessibility to the tools and resources, but it's those discussions that you have to have that says if you want to get the labor and you want the right labor and you want to differentiate yourself from the competition, you got to get a little creative. And so these reports have allowed us to say, if you want to play in that space and want to sit with the other 12 competitors in Dallas and, and fight for that labor, here's what you're going to have to do to differentiate yourself. If you want to get a little smarter, a little bit more creative, here are the outside boundaries that we're going to have to leverage. So that's been very helpful. We've been taking it at a kind of a hiring leader by hiring leader strategy and kind of making small wins and penetrations. Our next range is to really look at it more holistically against the job labor markets that labor categories, if you will, to say, okay, how do we then take that up a level and start influencing at a little bit different level when you think about talent management to look at internal mobility, external factors, um, and we did that with our medical clinics. So um, Minute Clinic is, um, if you haven't been, please go. Uh, <laughs> so we have a very uh, aggressive expansion plan with our Minute Clinics. Um, if you haven't gone, they're staffed with nurse, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. You know how easily readily that talent is. Yeah. Um, the and, the thank you. And, and they're in a retail market, which when you think about the compression of what it takes for retail to make a profit, you have to be very efficient within how you um, leverage that talent. And so part of Minute Clinic strategy was where are they going to actually open these markets? And it's not only where is a facility going to be leveraged by the community for instead of going to a primary care physician or urgent care that they're going to utilize our resources. So there's a ton of analysis that goes into that and how we can partner with that community. But then we had to be smart and we were fortunate enough to get a seat at the table 
and we had a third party consulting firm heavily leverage the supply demand portal to really dig through and figure out where is this nurse practitioner physician assistant labor, where are they and how is that and should it influence where we're opening locations because it's not only do the patients and will the patients come, but you know if you don't have a nurse practitioner that day, you're shut down um, and we aren't model to have multiple people on call and you can't just flip a nurse practitioner and say can you run from this minute clinic to this minute clinic. So they were very strategic in helping us identify and complement as an overlay where we should be um, identifying those locations and more importantly if we are going to have pressures where are those pressures going to be how do we get ahead of them how does that influence our cycle time for recruiting our compensation models so that we can smartly build it beforehand. Um, and so we were able to leverage this information with that data and actually get up to the board and, and make some incredible recommendations that was really impactful to say, it is not anecdotal, we know nurse practitioners are out there, here's where they're at, here's where they're not at, here's where it's going to be hard, here's where you may want to stay away from markets versus here's where you may be pulling talent in and relocating talent into those markets. I think one of the things that you touched on is that you were fortunate to have a seat at the table, and I think that's a question that a lot of people have is, which comes first? Do we drive that we need the strategy, or how do we get that seat at the table? So I'd love for each of you guys to kind of share um, who, who within the organization has owned the fact that you know talent is important to these types of strategies um, to give you either, whether it be the the human capital resources or the resources to go use tools to, to find that type of data? Uh, well, I, I'll start the, the, with regards to Minute Clinic. It was not myself, but um, our recruiting leader reports up to the chief nursing officer. Yeah. So at an operational level, okay. the Im embedding of talent and being able to deliver are um, highly integrated within that model. If I look at some of the other areas where we've played um, from a talent acquisition is when we looked at our call centers or our mail operations facilities where we've got a high volume. Um, we really fought for years to kind of get a seat at the table because all of a sudden we, it would come down that guess what? We're opening a call center in XYZ location and we're looking at everybody going, why in God's name are we there? There's, there's nothing around. Or more importantly, there's seven other call centers we're going to be competing. So I think we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated. We as a talent acquisition partnership with HR has been able to deliver. We, we do have credible resources and tools that can help influence so that we can make smarter decisions so that we're not fighting to close that back door because we're two or three dollars off marketplace or we're the fifth call center in the market, you know, everybody's jumping ship for a few dollars. So it's been a point of evolution, but the strategy with our, our medical clinic was a little bit different because talent acquisition and the operations are so tightly integrated, right? Um, for us, I think we were really fortunate in that the staffing organization had a very, um, very good reputation in the firm, so it was very well regarded as a partner and as providing you know, good service in the talent acquisition space. Um, and that combined with just uh, almost the perfect storm of business need for this type of information, um, as the business was growing and we were um, expanding in, in some of our other locations, there was just more of a need for that information. People were coming to Staffing because they had a good reputation to say, we're going to be hiring, we're trying to give you a heads up, we're thinking about this, we're thinking about that. At that exact moment, we started building our own capability to be able to provide the data. And so once we had the data um, and we were able to show it, I mean, it goes back to Abdel's, you know, we don't trust everyone wants to print data. Um, and that other slide that you use all the time, Abdel, which you didn't use today, but it gets a great slide that he's used that shows, you know, the top um, functions that gets space time with the CEO. Spend time with the CEO, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's like, you know, finance is up, is up here, and sales is up here, and HR is down here, and the difference is these guys up top show up at every meeting with forecasting and data and reports. Um, so I think if you, you know, having that great reputation is providing good service, then we have this, the skills to start to pull this information. We were actually coming and offering the data. That's what got us, you know, the foot in the door. Um, and once we had the, the benefit, that Dallas example is a good one, of, of making some, uh, providing some research, making some assumptions, um, you know, projecting some outcomes and then actually seeing them start to happen. As soon as that starts to happen, you're, you're building on your credibility. Um, and I think that's the key to this stuff. It, and it's one of the reasons why I don't know if you're going to now. Yep, go for it. The way we structure our use of this is, is a little bit different, I think, than some of the other folks that use these tools. We're very closely held. Um, <coughs> we have the ability to have everybody 
in our staffing function log in and use these tools and provide data. Um, but we held it very close to a small team of people to actually process, manage, and, and roll the request. And the reason we've done that is, you know, credibility is, is hard won and easily lost. And if you have someone presenting data who doesn't understand the data, you know, they're showing a chart and saying, well, this is what it says, and then they get asked a few questions and they can't answer the questions, then your credibility quickly erodes. So we actually took the strategy from the beginning that we would have a small group of people pulling the data together, providing the reports, um, and then kind of passing them on. What we've expanded to do now is to do that and then sit with the recruiters and have a 30-minute kind of education session where we walk them through the report and we push them on all the different questions and help them understand how they can answer them um, so that recruiters are now able to do more uh, direct one-to-one -one with the hiring managers. Um, they hadn't been really doing that. We've been doing it more at the strategic level. Here's the big report about the, the workforce. Now it's, you know, here's the big report, but then here's, you know, Bob has a rec. Let's talk to Bob about his rec, and we're getting to that point. Um, it's also a challenge that we found that's come up a couple of times today. You know, this data is very sensitive. It, it's considered by most, you know, most companies consider employee data very sensitive. This is, if you're trying to match the external labor market data with your internal employee data, that's sensitive stuff. It also belongs to a lot of people, depending on who you ask. So you have to be, for us, we had to be you know, very cognizant of our partners in our line HR roles, in our compensation, any roles that might touch up against this type of data and make sure that we were vetting it with them. One of the things we're very focused on right now is building uh, a stronger partnership with our comp teams so that they know, um, you know what we have available as data sources and we know that they have, you know, everybody's compensation team spends a lot of money and time on research and partnering to get all the right comp data. We want to make sure that whatever we're providing out to the field doesn't conflict with whatever their sources are, or if it does, how can we sync up so that we make sure we're providing uh, data that everyone's on board with? Because that's another quick way to erode your credibility. You come out with a nice flashy report, and then, you know, mm -hmm. let's say Comp, for example, comes into the room and says, none of that is true. Let me show you my data. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, now it's like a, a data sumo match, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Your customer is just sitting there watching, very confused, not understanding, you know, whose data is, is going to win. Um, so that's been something for us closely held and kind of rolling it out incrementally instead of being the big yeah. how we use it. And I, I, I'm going to kind of add to that. Um, for those who don't know, prior to, to managing the New England office, I spent about two years as um, kind of our in between of, of the Adels of the world, our product developers and the sales force. And so I'm on a training call one day with, and I'm, I'm just listening. To an organization as they're using this client man and I'm watching them and they're you know they're talking about how they found this great data they're in Waltham and they were looking for a developer and they ran their search and I'm watching them do this and they're like we're so excited we're going and we're presenting this data tomorrow well when they ran the search they ran it in Waltham Massachusetts well that means it's only going to provide you back the people who are advertising and live in Waltham which is a suburb of Boston um, the problem is, is that in Boston they'll commute, so that's not your competition, and it was, and it's that user error of, well, you, this isn't what you do full time, mm -hmm. um, and you know you spent 30 minutes training on it, and so you were about to present that bad data to your executives and make a decision on what your comp was going to be or what you were going to be recruiting or whatever it may be, uh, when you've taken all of the greater Boston area out of that that perspective. So I think that's a very valid point. I think each company kind of owns that, that process a little bit differently. Yeah. Oh, I think our, our biggest challenge is though we have a distributed model where the recruiters were using that, it does become a point of subject matter expertise is are they really applying the same robust search methodology to say, am I getting the right results? Because I think, as we all know, are they asking the right questions? Am I putting in the right territory? Am I putting in some of the right search criteria in the terminology and the breadth of terminology? Because it's not just a project manager. It could be this, this, or this. And I need to look at those different skill sets in that different area. And then I think the other piece, as you alluded to, is the credibility of how do you sell the data? Because my recruiters are used to selling candidates. You know, they're used to selling experience to come back and ask them to understand the data, to be able to articulate it in a way to a leader that 
may not understand it, maybe pushing back already, maybe looking for more information. How do you coach them to that skill set when quite honestly that may not be the proficiency? So we too are struggling with um, how do you leverage your resources internally to be able to say, I'd love, I'd love that. I'd love to have my team do this. Um, to say, you'd really love to garner them because you don't want to try to train 80 people to touch something as important as this. Um, how do you get a few people that become your subject matter expertise that you can then cascade that information out? Um, and more importantly, how do they then coach and go with your hiring leader because you have that one shot with the hiring leader to make it or break it. And if you break it the first time, you spend too much time trying to rebuild that credibility. And it's so easy to come out there with a, a knockout of the ballpark if you come out with great data, um, or at least good data and a great way to sell it and a great way to connect it with what the environment's going to be. So a question kind of on the flip side of this and how you kind of alluded to it when it came to the comp data. Um, but when you are delivering the data that you have available, whether it be through supply and demand or entities or other resources, to hiring managers or chief nursing officers, whoever the stakeholders are, do you ever limit kind of what you're delivering to them? Because giving them certain pieces of data will lead them in maybe a direction you don't want them to go to? Um, yes, we do limit the, the data that we share. Um, Less because we don't want to lead them in a in a in a different direction. Um, we're not that manipulative. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Some days. <laughs> uh, but more because it it's it's um, sometimes there's there's too much information right. and there's information that you know if you share it it's going to end up in a conversation of a half an hour around something that is completely not germane in the scope of all the data as to the question that we're trying to answer and it really depends on the audience of who you're sharing it with and the objective of that audience. For some for some of the clients we work with, sharing everything with them because we're trying to facilitate, it's more of a brainstorming around something um, versus there are others we're trying to ask, answer a specific ask. We're gonna be real targeted in what we share with them. Um, you know, we have some folks that we only share the competitor information because all they care about is who else is hiring the market. Mm -hmm. No one talk about anything else. We do the analysis because we know that once they look at it, they're probably gonna have three other questions but we may only share them the screen grab um, you know, of the competitors. So that, that definitely is something that we do is limit it. And the other thing that um, I'll say about that is sometimes we make that choice because one thing that does happen is as you start to share this data, um, remarkably data has legs and it gets up and walks around. Oh wow, that's going down with but it gets up and walks around. <laughs> Um, you know, we've had cases where someone got so excited about the data that the next thing you know, they blast it to a much larger audience. So it's sometimes thinking about, well, I've created this nice little data and I've wrapped it in a bow and I've handed it to you and enjoy the data, but please don't give it to anyone else because it'll be out of context. You don't always get that, that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we do, do some data um, trimming, mm -hmm. data packaging, because we know that it, wherever it goes, it's got to be in context. The um, person on my team who's now focused on this 100%, one of the real value adds that she's brought to the team is when she packages this stuff, she did very simple things that, that we had never done before, like including glossaries in the back. Mm -hmm. This is what this means. This is what this data set is. If you're looking at this, this is where we got it, and this is what it means. Um, you know, We always include the, the sources that we're using to get it. Um, but, but be mindful that it can actually get up and, and walk over to somebody else's desk and now you've got to explain that. has really helped us in making sure that we're very detail oriented about what we share. I would expand upon that, particularly around the compensation piece, because it can quickly get um, misinterpreted, mm -hmm. especially when a hiring leader says, I'm not even making that. So this becomes a great excuse for now why people on my team should make more money, and of course I then should make more money too. So if there's some discrepancies usually within the compensation data that may not align with our internal equity, those are usually discussions that we start first with HR that says, hey, here's what we're dealing with. Um, what are you understanding with this particular business unit? And, and we may be getting information that they don't necessarily readily share that says, listen, we're going through a comp analysis, we're restructuring some of the skill set, we're moving people around, um, let's be mindful when you guys are coming out here, the, the driver behind the compensation is X. It may be moving, but we're not ready to move it now. So don't go use this data to just try to push your agenda. So there has to be a lot of collaboration around that. So I think it is kind of piecemealing what that looks like. 
I would say the other piece is as we go through and educate our leaders on the information and the tools that we're using is to allow them to be part of the solution. So they too can sometimes be part of making sure that we are looking at, as we explain our methodology, where should we be looking at expanding between transferable skill sets to particular locations or hey, they live in the area and they may be um, providing us more anecdotal information because the recruiter that's supporting them sits in Dallas and doesn't know that people have a badge of honor commuting an hour and 45 minutes. I'll sit in traffic for NASCAR for that, but I'm certainly not sitting on 75 to drive to work every day. So those are other things I think we can use as we go through with the hiring leader community is once you start getting them engaged and involved is to also get them accountable to make sure that they understand the data that we're representing their world correctly because we are what we are in recruiting. We, we, we help solution and sell, we aren't the doers. And so sometimes we cannot be as fully connected as we need to be. Let me, I was gonna ask a question, James. I really do what, what I hear from you guys, there's amazing cases. I wish I'd read the tickets because I go educate a lot of the market, spend a lot of time. Should be video. Uh, should you? Although should be. the screen is not I know, that's what I'm saying. live anymore. <laughs> yeah, actually, what you guys did, you were you're probably the most advanced, some of the most advanced line that I had in that regard because you guys are combining the data, the story, the context, and then you make it specific to your audience. And look, I'm going to tell you and what I love about all the cases you guys said, you work with the other group. I saw this with Debbie and the team before. I had this in an African program. They said, if you want to go fast, I'm from Mali. If you want to go fast, you go long. If you want to go far, you go together. So what you guys do in every case I'm hearing is you got to combine with your stakeholder, who are your stakeholders. But I have a question for James regarding to that. From all the clients that I met in every industry, the hardest client to convince, I find is engineer. When I deal with a room of engineer, process engineer, if I do a slide, let's say for 10 slides for a client, for sales, sales is just one assembly. We just want to get two slides. If you do it with sales engineer, process engineer, have to put 60 slides. They don't worry about they don't worry about the outcome. They want to hear your process, how do you get there? I was gonna ask Jeff, how do you convince GE you have a lot of process in here? They're obsessive. You will spend 90% of your time talking about how do you get there, and then the last 10% talk about the, the end result. How do you deal with that? You have a tougher audience with engineers. Yeah, but there's a cultural speed thing that kind of narrows that down for us a little bit. So it's not quite as bad as having to share all of our process. One is that we just talk about, you know, we come in and we start talking data. Now the good thing is, is that I started my career as an engineer and how to Okay, so I didn't have to say this is So, so we, we, we talk geek talk for the first 10 minutes, usually just kind of softening the room okay. a little bit to build that credibility. And sometimes it's about just connecting with the people that, it, that are in the room to get them to understand, we understand your challenge, and we share the same language. And that piece typically works pretty well for us. Um, you know, it, it's really funny, I'm, I'm thinking of, I rarely get called into any one of these things, but I occasionally get called in. And there was one, and it was an engineering manager who was being extremely difficult with a recruiter. You know, it's like being, to, and I was sitting there with a the guy, and I said, wait a minute, he explained the job, I said, explain this a, a little bit more than this. How many people in the world have can, do you think can do that job? I don't know, 100? No. Less, okay. 50? No. 25? Okay, yeah, thereabouts. Said, okay. How many of them are currently employed? He said, well, all of them. And I said, well, dude, you gotta open your wallet and show them they're beautiful if you plan on that happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? This was not a data conversation. This is just a, sometimes it comes down to, let's roll back some common sense for a moment. Let's talk about where we are and what you're looking for, but we built relationships before that happened. I would say the space where we've had the most interesting dialogues actually with government relations. Oh my. Because you can imagine if we're going to build a facility, we could spend $400 million to build a new facility somewhere. So it's a heck of an investment. It might be the biggest investment they're going to get in a decade in their community. And then we come in with high-skilled jobs. So we have to partner and educate our government relations teams to understand, please don't make a commitment that will be nearly impossible for us to meet on employment in certain markets. And that has been a bit of a challenge in an education. 
And then sometimes it's even a bit of an education for our senior leaders. Now, hopefully you will not repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> but we all, yeah, because maybe they didn't talk They'll never look at that. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about somebody telling tell them story later. No, it, 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 that, that's a really interesting place. I mean, you guys are seeing it played out, right? You see it played out with Tesla, right? You've got California, New Mexico, Arizona, who I think, I don't know what the states are about to do to get, get that, that facility to Texas to get the facility located there. And I'm interested to know some of the options they're talking about. I'm like, really? You're going to get the quality of skill in some of the places you're talking about? Because a couple of them that were mentioned in that list, I went, I don't know if you're really going to have the, the talent there. I understand you might be able to build the facility there, and I understand you might be able to get a great tax incentive to put it there, but what are we going to pay to relocate all the people and all the skill, and then what kind of turnover rate are we gonna have? Because people are gonna go there for a couple of years when we relocate them, but then they're gonna say, I'm gonna go home. I wanna go back so that you know when we have our first kid, we have built-in babysitting and all this other stuff that that infrastructure is not around our uh, community there. So that's the piece where we start talking to people about that, talking to leaders about it, that if I were to say the hardest one to get is actually that team for us, less the team around engineering. Only because of the background, and some of it's just the skill set of people that are involved, and also because we take time to build relationship. But the other thing is, there's a contagion of example. And once you start to get enough use cases, you actually go from trying to see where you might want to have it to throttling the gate. Because what is the other problem of sharing this data is every recruiter who may be having a hard time, including some somewhat low performing recruiters that we have, then want to say, give me some data so I can show the manager I can't find what I'm looking for. And it's like, okay, first of all, if we give you data, it will tell the story that the data tells, not the story that you want it to. And actually, Adele, I think you have a great quote around that too, of the, you don't use data to... Yeah, so what I said is, I have this problem because I have a client that called me, staff and client or something, what is your power recruiter? And they become lazy because of the data. So I, I went to train the staff in front of the recruiter, tell them, go use the, value, the data to value the problem. Use the data to solve the problem. And one of them almost got fired because he kept confirming, he kept calling, I told you so before. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> so I'm gonna get fired. All he does is, whenever I send him, he's like, what do you think they need? I'm like, you keep sending him. They're like, they're not getting enough applicants. So what he does, he grabs me, he calls me. He like, send me data. I'm gonna show them why there is not enough applicants. I'm like, no, you wanna show them other city where they can recruit from. He's like, you think so? I'm like, yes. Don't worry, the problem, solve them. So I think that's probably easier to So when you think about the number of people that are looking at the data, how they're analyzing the data, and are they asking the right questions, it sometimes becomes, are you asking the questions to turn around and ask the other questions that follow behind, which says, I see the data is telling me X, that's not gonna solve my problem, so I need to be looking at the data in a, in a different way that says, wow, the data is telling me my people aren't here, but then is your data telling you where the people are and where you maybe need to go? Or are there alternative skill sets, transferable skills? And I think that, if you need to think about who's looking at the data, who's leveraging the data, and who's sharing the data, there is a finite skill set to be able to influence people to share that story, to take something that is um, actionable um, so that it doesn't become that I told you, or it comes off with legs that somebody interprets that information differently because you have the, the great visuals that come with it that yes, this is a really hard job to recruit for. Well, hard yes, based on the parameters that you typed in. If I shift my parameters, yeah. how do I become you know, make it easier, more attainable, whether it be more costly, longer to fill, but I think those are the, the elements that when you introduce this into your talent management organization, it comes with an additional skill set, which is how do you educate and coach your staff to take data and make it a solution instead of the problem. Yeah, but I think that's what everybody's looking for. How do you guys go from the big question to the big answer? Because I, I how do you go from the oh, sorry, you have a question. Oh, oh. I was gonna say, you have to get really creative too to get to come up with the answers. I come from the source and screen team where we have a partnership with a big transportation company all over the US, uh, over 30 terminals. And CDLA drivers nearly impossible to report right now. We should now. talk about Yes. <laughs> 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 so we created a 360 snapshot for the slide for all of their critical needs terminals 
pretty much saying there are five CDL gate drivers in Abilene, Texas right now. So what do you do then? And the thing is, what they relied on us to do, and we actually did it as a team um, on weekly calls, is just come up with ideas of creating Twitter accounts and um, you know doing job fairs and doing open houses and doing barbecues and putting signs and doing referral programs. And you just have to start getting the sign-on bonuses and just have to get creative. That's, that's where you get the answers from, but it's hard. It, it's, it's not easy to come up with all these ideas. But how do you guys make it systematic from big, big question to big answer? Right, with the, the, I think you have to think about who's using the tools and who's putting together the information. And I think we have to, the person that's doing that has to have almost an innate curiosity. Yeah. Because yeah. like you were saying, they might only ask you one question. Yeah. But you know what? I want someone to come to me, and I've had this happen where a recruiter come to me and say, I'm, I'm trying to hire a, a Java developer in Salt Lake City. Can you just pull some data for me on that? No. Sure. So I'll go pull the data. I'll look at the data. I'll say, eh, it all looks like this, looks like that. And I'll say, hmm, I wonder what our other location looks like. Or I wonder what that location looks like. Or I wonder if I change the years of experience we're looking for. So you have to have that kind of innate curiosity to poke around, move some of the levers, so you can figure out what the backstory is. So here's the information you asked for, and then here's some other information you didn't ask for, but it may be something that influences what you decide to do next. But I do believe that's probably the value of your model where you've got that centralized issue. You've got a, a, a person and team with a skill set that already is coming to the table and can use that as an opportunity to coach and train recruiters. Stop, you don't stop asking questions, right? Because you stop asking questions to stop really solving, not getting to the right answer. Um, and I think with this data, it is a matter because it's, it's also based on what people put in. It's based on market trends. and. It's based on transferable skills, and so there's always a different way to look at the data and push it just a little bit, whether it's, am I getting creative? Am I driving over the line? Am I looking at a different location? And I think that isn't always what leaders are looking for. Sometimes it's, I'm looking for this skill set. I've got to have this person. They've got to be able to produce this. By the way, there's only 25 of them in the world, and I know they're all employed, but I'm pretty sure they want to work for me. <laughs> so, um, and I, and since they are, I know that they're out there waiting to be called. Um, so, but I, th I think it's an opportunity too that you look at a, the skill sets within talent acquisition, and you talked about sales being in demand, and I look at a core competency of a recruiter sales. Yep. I have to be able to sell, which means I better be able to listen and understand what problem you're really trying to solve. And I, I better be able to ask six more questions because I don't know that the, what you told me you tried to solve is really what you're trying to solve. Yep. And trying to use the data to influence that, I think the skill set of a recruiter has to evolve to be able to actually get in front and solve the problems. Or you're going to have to modify your recruiting model to say, who is behind the scenes doing the data analysis? pulling those levers and then getting the right talent in front of leaders to be able to get them to make actual decisions. Yeah. We also centralize the activity. It, it, the general recruiting population does not have access to the data just because they're not going to do it often enough. Right. So we don't, we want to centralize it. And, and kind of like, I mean, I liken it to the market intelligence function, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about your marketing organizations, there's a few people who do really great market intelligence and then they help the marketers understand it and they help you know with the competitive landscape. This is the same thing in town. It's, it's, so you generally you know have an understanding and, a, and an awareness of amongst people that are the more practitioner space, but you need some level of specialization, even if it's just a fraction of a person. But you need to get in there often enough that you can. Just reckon A, get comfortable with the tool that you're looking at it off and up, but B, that you have it in your head, oh yeah, I've looked at something similar and this is what we thought about, because it, otherwise it's just too dispersed and you'll never get any scale to be able to get good answers, I think, going forward. Right, or your example of welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, I went out quickly, I thought I solved my problem, but I just used the wrong search criteria and nobody really, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You had a question. And yeah, I was about I was to just, say. I was just going to say, you know, the answer to your question is one. I think what I've been hearing the whole time, which which is really interesting, is I, I think you guys bring a different perspective than where a lot of HR people are coming from. And it's one, it's not internally focused, and you guys are looking outside. But I think the answer, you know, how do you get the, the answer not? You said, how do you solve the problem not answer? Is, is you're finding insights that are not answering the questions. 
and, and that's where you get your credibility. And I bet once you come up with a big insight that raises a whole bunch of other questions, it, that's probably hard to turn it off for people just to keep coming to you. And, and I, you know, I, I think that's what, what I'm hearing. But all three of the companies are, are looking at something broader. And I think the point of centralizing, when you're, when you're settling the business, and you don't have that opportunity to look outside of but I also think it's a skill that, um, yeah, it's really exciting when you get some of the people just see things in their real CDs. That's an example of an example of what you guys talk about. It's just because we look at the data different from others. You see that you know, people don't even see it, even if questions are not being asked. That's true. Because I was going to ask Steve, I'm going to call him yeah. How do you, I, the other industry, when you went down the wall, how do you, people get curious to get from the big questions? You know, it's just, I mean, as the, the group that was doing the, the data and trying to tell the story with them, right? So we, it would be kind of really up to us to kind of look at it and we talked about it. And, um, you know, try, try, try to provide some, you know, I don't know, if we're looking at we're working with uh, Mark, and we also did testing too, so we worked with Mark and trying a new program so we could test it, look at it free and close, and, you know, test the control. Get some insights from that, and maybe provide that helps guide some business decisions because you have the background how the small business might roll up in the overall chain. Um, versus, you know, we would, you know, taking millions and millions of you know, each month we have like, like there's over 300 million transactions say, in a year. So we're looking at just each individual transactions and that data, and how do you people you know, tell what insights you get out of that line of data? Right? So we would take that and roll it up. Relationships between again, you know, say for merchandising, you know, what products sell well with other products, right? And uh, we would try to focus on certain things like that. Uh, you know, what are the, you know, for, for staples, for instance, that ink is a big category for computers. Uh, so we would kind of focus on those categories. Um, you know, we're we're in, you know, a big portion of the sales drove to the top. Um, we would look at that category in particular and try to find areas or relationships or, or is there anything that, that's driving the performance of that category and we could bring those. And and then we, then it's up to the operation folks or whoever to figure out how they address it, whether they want to uh, change the store formats around or, or whatever or, or change where things are located in the store. But we would hopefully take some data and, and just again focus on the areas that we knew were, were big drivers of the business and then you know let the Executives and, and the folks in the other areas. So, like an example of nurse practitioner, I think it, yeah, you, you yeah. Said it's a different strategy for nurse practitioner, for IT, yes. for CDL. And yeah. I think so that's, have, yeah. that's each, you know, it's the nurse practitioner, it's the Dallas, Te Texas example. And, you know, for you guys, it started 13 years ago and kind of developing that and building that credibility. So, well, I think you mentioned something earlier where, you know, looking at where the supply demand is, is kind of focused you know, externally and there are internal factors. So I think, Steve, where you guys are at TJ Maxx as far as looking at a large data warehouse, truly building business intelligence, there are internal factors that certainly influence attraction and retention. Uh, you know, we're certainly not there yet as an organization. We, we look at where we are so sophisticated at an enterprise across analytics is our retail store. We have 15 years of extra care loyalty program, the largest of its kind, immense amount of data. We've got wickedly smart people that are able to look at trends, behaviors, and patterns between buying, but they're very finite. It's a product, it's a product line, and all of a sudden you start to try to apply that to personal attributes that flex, and um, just because we may be two women, we may still be blonde, we still have different backgrounds, different drivers, and so that innate element of the human capital nature makes, I think, analytics a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't typically have, and I know at our, our organization, we're trying to get to that, the investment for HR of getting the right data warehouse, getting all the data normalized and getting it in there, and understanding how we ask the right questions to know what data we should be putting in the tool and that we're doing it consistently to then say these are the 16 reports that we want to really focus on to tell the trends. And where's our ink? Where's our computers, right? Is it IT, is it finance, right? We're not gonna go boil the ocean, but where do we really focus on that? And that's where we are making that shift organizationally. 
supply demand and support, those things really help us at a recruiting level, but we really have to get to the next level, which is what does that look like at a talent management level, so that I, I solve that not only attraction but retention and then that mobility because I really want to take you and I would love to take you out of digital and move you over to the HR team. I would love to know that HR has got credibility and I'm mo you know, rotating my recruiting person into an account management role for client benefits. Um, and so that's, that's our next big push. Yeah, I think we're both the You said you've been there for three years and in another seven years you might mm -hmm. then So the same with TJX, there's a lot of tenure there. So yeah, we're focusing a lot on you know, retirement's coming up, right? Maybe when people have been there for a while and then you know, making sure we have the people in the pipeline. So that's one of our focuses. So I think it may have been in staples, but I think we're really focusing on these long standing folks where we're gonna have these gaps and these needs and just making sure that we've got we're developing people in front of the to fill those roles. And then there's a whole other thing between baby boomers leaving and millennials coming in and how do you address the differences between you know part of this acquisition and stuff too and trying to recruit this thing. A whole other panel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a new set come in. I know. And we have actually already gone over on the time, and I uh, we have meant to save some time for you guys. I'm glad this has been interactive. I will take one more question. So if you've got one more question out there, anyone for any of the panelists? None? Yes, Sharon. I think the, the retention piece that you just alluded to, too, is a big challenge for us. We have um, not only do we have areas, and, and as you're talking, you know, thinking about our Palm Desert store, where it's primarily retirees, and it's out in the middle of literally nowhere to drive there. And so getting people, getting design consultants who can sell, which is kind of a different challenge in and of itself. But finding them out there is one thing, but it's that retention. And I think in our, in our um, world, it's partly because we're commission only on our sales. And so we, we have people leave us because we've asked them to leave and that's just because they want because they're not meeting their sales oh, goals. Wow. So um, I'm not quite sure what I'm trying to say, but I think all the data of um, you know of sourcing is great, but it's that piece, you know, I'm listening to you and I think we can use some of it to help us think about how we're retaining it's certainly skills that we hired by people and all that. So I don't know, it's going to that next level that, that we need to take a look at. So I think what I'm hearing as what we connect is the performance and management piece. Yes. So I, I, I understood the profile. I understood the leader told me what they were looking for. Right. I've somehow got them, you know, I've handed them off. Recruiting says we've delivered the people, they're yours. We consider ourselves a success after a certain period. Recruiting sometimes looks at, you know, tenure and retention for a certain period of time of what we own as far as our calibration. But it's really looking at the performance and how do you tie back performance into all of this because it should be influencing recruiter and how we're going after people because that performance should be influencing the job description and the competencies and the capabilities that we then turn into what does that perfect person look like and then are we modeling how to sell to that person to keep them here from a retention perspective and we certainly don't have that secret sauce I think it's you know looks different for every organization and even within certain business units it looks different. I think it also overlay commission versus a salary, you know, a, a base and plus a, a bonus of commission. Because, you know, I like to go back and look at that organization and define when you work, base plus commission versus the other, how, how successful we are. So you've got me thinking, you know, mm -hmm. about what, what other pieces of data I need to put into the next time to submit a portal. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and I think Jennifer brought up a good point, especially as somebody who comes from a sales background. Um, but the the point is that you have to understand that a a bonus plus commission and a commission only are two totally different profiles oh, yes. of drivers. Yes. So when you make oh, that when you make that shift as an organization, does the organization realize that that means you are going to turn over the majority of your staff in doing that and change the profile of the candidate you're trying to bring on? If you want that retention, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're having that very conversation just about you know those platforms, right? And it's a very interesting thing to talk about. It's like there are certain changes we can make. You know, we're extremely low turnover organization as far as voluntary quit rate. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, we do change the portfolio of the company. So we saw a spin out Synchrony Financial. We may sell a business, buy some other stuff. But as a voluntary quit rate, it's very low, and especially low in the leader ranks because of how the structure is set up. And I, I argue 
as we're sitting there and people are talking about it and they're talking about, well, maybe we need to make this change so that we become more entrepreneurial, I said at the same time, we become more mercenary. And you have to understand that that's going to happen. You know, like there's almost this fixation these days on we need to be more like the Valley. You know, we need to be more like Silicon Valley. Everybody wants to do that. And I'm like, but we don't quit. I mean, if we were more like the Valley, none of you would have your job. You know, none of you would have been 30-year GE veterans where you started, you know, right out of college, went through the accelerator programs, went on audit staff went to Crotonville four times for all the leader development courses in Ossini, that would not be our history. Because that is a different, not just because they're not old enough to have done that, but that is also not how they function as companies. And that's a much harder problem to try to think about. Because the attributes that you're looking for are things that we don't actually capture in HR systems very often. Because in the US, we don't really do that much psychometric testing or any sort of assessment center kind of activity we actually lack some of the more fundamental pieces of data that our European colleagues might have on leaders and on professionals to actually help us make that kind of decision. Because we don't understand, all right, if this is the kind of people that are going to be successful, we know, you know, how old were you? We understand what job you had maybe before you came to us if we're really sophisticated. Um, we understand your educational background. But those things are so, Generic. They're not going to say whether a person's going to drive 35 miles out into the desert in Palm Desert to actually, you know, start making sales to 80 year olds or not. You know, I mean, that's a much harder thing to do. I'm sure. We don't even contain the data in our HR systems to really do that a lot of times. So how do we? How do we even talk about it? Yeah. You can compare it to your Dallas store that's seven miles away from where they live. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the Dallas market, is this, you know, they're all on top of each other. You know, yeah. There's, yeah. You know, big word here. That's because we don't drive that far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for validating my data. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, so it's good insight. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. And thank you guys. I know we've got a little over. Uh, Abdel is going to actually close us off with a quick 10-minute recap. Um, and then you're more than welcome to stay. I know a lot of you have these long commutes back to Boston or to wherever you're from. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Yeah. I'm going to show you the last piece. I'm going to do a recap from what I got. I want to ask you guys before, before what I'm setting up, what is your takeaway from... Uh, I'm going to go around the room quickly. It's plugged in. It's plugged in. So, I, think. I think they're going to hit the restroom? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm going to give them two minutes for the people to hit the restroom. And then we're going to do a recap. The takeaway. Be prepared. I'm going to call all of you to hear your takeaway. Steve, you can watch me. I'm watching you right there. <laughs> Be prepared. I'm going to, we're going to do like a school. This is school homework. Everybody going to go through the three takeaway. Maybe we do the takeaways now. Yeah. So let's go around the room. Guys, we're going to make the takeaway. Everybody going to give us a takeaway from the panelists from everything so far today. Steve, I'm going to start with you. You're not going to start with you. You should have sat next to a Delta today okay. as your takeaway. <laughs> uh, I want everybody to hear his takeaway. I, I, I'm going to go around the room. Everybody going to say takeaway. Go ahead, Steve. Poor Steve, he said next to me before. I don't know. I mean, my takeaway is, I mean, you know, I think data is valuable. expectations and setting up governance and a framework for who really is responsible for all of these things if we are saying what those are. Perfect. But uh, how, uh, so what, what's your takeaway from how do you move from big answer, big question to the big answer? I don't think anyone's really going to have the answer to that question. Last group, uh, but I like uh, Kelly feedback and his feedback was more 
the whole uh, find people who are curious, who are adding, asking more of questions. People need to ask more questions, like you said. Um, so, go ahead. Your feed. Right, what's your takeaway? So you're feeling better. It's, it's yeah. making you feel better. Remember what I told you guys at the beginning? You're never as good as you are. So you think you are, you're never as bad as you think you are. I hope this is what this session is about. Yeah. <laughs> Light therapy, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Never as bad as you think you are, I love that. Um, <laughs> so I work in a Hartford and I think we have a reputation as a older stocky insurance company. Um, we're quite a bit better than I thought we were. Okay. Yeah. Um, where we have actually put a model together that we call a talent lead model where they're actually reporting out to the business. On the analytics, we've got a really good core set of analytics that we use across the enterprise, and we've been flexing that model for the last two years. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait to go tell my colleagues how far ahead of the curve. <laughs> you see, I just, I just said that. <laughs> so. Well, I think that what I'll take away from this is, you know, certainly understanding the data is not more and the opportunity to use it and take it back and, and, and apply it to, you know, not only our sourcing, but, you know, trying to think about how I can help with our um, turnover and retention is taking a look at some of the areas where we're including in. So and, uh, certainly working with our career building department to, uh, to help us interpret the data a bit more. So I think that, um, quite honestly, in a smaller organization, HR organization <coughs> such as ours, um, where we do a lot of recruiting in our um, HR office, however, quite a few positions are done right at the school level. So there are maybe three recruiters in HR in Danbury, however, all for 100, by 150 out in the field. So that's 150 different approaches, and yeah. 150 oh, boy. different yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it is a Yeah, exactly. So I think it's just taking the, the, all of the ideas I've heard around the room today and, the, you know, figuring out the questions we really do need to ask, taking a look at the data that we do get from our HRS and saying, okay, so now I have more questions. Don't have any answers. More questions. Very helpful. I mean, Jared, most of you, I can tell you, uh, Kelly hear me speak at conference worldwide. Whenever I go to conference anywhere, every country, every company thinks they're unique. My whole goal, I'm like, you guys think you're unique. They're like, you don't understand. Especially when you talk to the hiring manager. They're like, you don't understand. We are very, very unique. <laughs> <laughs> Even the HR team told me that. I'm like, what she is going to say that? But then I go to representation. I don't to be blunt, but they're like, we all have the same challenge. And they're like, no, no, they don't want to hear it. Uh, what did you take away? Yeah, I said a few things earlier, but I would just, uh, I would just have one really just interesting to hear all the different ways. And you've got to be thinking about things we've done that have been great, but, you know, the fact that we're teaching with business and sites. And I can give you examples of ones where we use data. It was pretty Wait, good. and one where we did it, and ones we didn't. Yeah, we're real for fame. Um, but I think the, uh, the biggest kind of you know, thing for me is, is uh, you can go look for this stuff everywhere. And it's really being clear up front. What is it? You know, what do we care about? Like, what kind of decisions do we need to make for? And what are we looking for? Not, not the answer. You know, not, not what's the answer we're looking for, but what are the questions? We really don't have to answer for it. It's the same as whether or not we're going to be the 
what do we do to keep our birds safe? <laughs> yeah, I have heard this before. There's three guys in the world that do this. And, and two of them work for us. Okay, so, well. Yeah. So I'm going to go walk you through two or three examples, and then what we do is Brad Bean to solve some of the challenges you guys have. So I'm going to walk you through. Look, five. Five. Uh, I'm going to quickly tell you an example that uh, you got to be careful with the data. My CEO asked me to take over the semantic search. We have what we call semantic search. Fixed problem, like you guys are describing. The recruiter get a new job description. He tried to find a candidate. We have example of the recruiter said, I cannot find this candidate. So for a long time, we went back. I went to the semantic search, took over the team. I said, tell me how you're gonna solve this problem. They show me this recruiter, particular client. They kept looking at his keyword in our resume database. They're like, this guy is the toughest. He keep putting keyword that you don't know find any candidate. We should try to solve this problem. And they kept trying to optimize it for six months. This recruiter for staffing firm, he always put some specific keyword. And our tech guys were trying to optimize that keyword. I said, how about we give him a call? They're like, are you crazy? We should optimize this keyword. Let's do it automatically. I give him a call. I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna call him. This is my approach. I took over the team, we're gonna change my approach. I like to talk to people. I pick up the phone, we call him. We said, look, by the way, you have the top of search. You always put some keyword that are random. You always, you're very consistent at the top. How do you pick the keyword for the job description? He said, I just pick a random one. I don't have the industry expertise. I just pick some random keyword. I said, you see, you guys, you guys are trying to optimize somebody, a process that is almost impossible to optimize. He sa I said, okay, what do you need help with? He said, I asked him, can we take your whole job description and search it for you? He said, yeah, that would be very beneficial. I took around to the technology group. They said, you, by helping us grabbing the whole job to do the search, you make a life 100 times easier. I'm like, why do you guys spend six months trying to optimize the keyword that person pick randomly? So this is sometimes why I took over the team. The first thing I asked them, talk to people, look, no, don't look at the data, ask them what is the context. So we were trying to solve a problem that didn't exist. So what we did for this, this is a case that I did for this recruiter. I grabbed a position, Java developer, he was looking Java Oracle. So all he kept putting this keyword, but he found a few people. What I ended up telling him, and this is 99%, this is a problem of inefficiency, people don't ask questions. 99% of recruiter when they write a new job description. Guess what do they do? They copy other job description. And they're like, oh my God, nobody find the application. Did you keep in mind, maybe you should open some resume people you're targeting. They're like, why you should do that? I'm like, are you targeting your competition or are you targeting candidate? <laughs> so what we're gonna do in the new semantic search, I change it, we're gonna basically, you are gonna have a job description, show you what your competition call it, but more importantly, show you what his job seeker calls himself. So guess what? We did that for this recruiter. He went from three, four to 300. I know, good guys call, that's what I'm making on. But this is, this is a, again, I'm trying to tell you the story to show you how you gotta be careful with data. You have to talk to people, get a context. We were literally, they were optimizing for this person for six months, optimizing the wrong problem. So quickly, what we done with Brad Bean is I hear, how can you help us with semantic search so we can use our own internal database? We can hear, look, everybody said we have an internal database, they don't use it. So that's what we try to solve with Brad Bean. What we plan to do, so I'll give you an idea, with Brad Bean, what we're gonna do is, you grab the job description, before you post it, we're gonna tell you how many candidates you have internally with a semantic search. Because as you guys know, you build a database, I would say most of you, 90% of us, your recruiter, every time don't use it, they go outside. So we're gonna build it as part of the process. The second thing is, all of you talk about return as far as a different calculation. How do you measure your effectiveness for your team? Again, how do you build a data warehouse team when you, have, you don't have a data warehouse team? How do you build the ROI, every step of the talent recruitment? How do you measure? Everybody use different measure. So what Brad Bean did, they build a service where they take your different data source, they merge it, merge it, and came up with a cool KPI, can show you what is effective recruitment list. What's the best source? For this type of position, job category, how long you have took you historically? So we, with Brad Bean tool, we're getting talent management. This is a version of talent management. And Kelly told me a year ago, this was her dream, and this is one reason I acquired Brad Bean. We're gonna try to solve with Kelly. No, no, it was funny. Kelly kept coming, she's like, you have to get in this field. You have to get in search tracking. You have to get in this thing. 
I'm like, I know Kelly, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> for six months, she's like, how are you gonna build it? I'm not gonna build it. She's like, how are you gonna make it happen? I'm gonna buy it, I didn't want to it. <laughs> but what they built, they built it, you can see they did their homework. Kelly have a demo, we gotta figure out how to make it in their system. They built the, the data toward a conversation. They nailed it. You know, we talk about report, I learned from them where they're like, who are you meeting today, the recruiter? Are you meeting the hiring manager? What is conversation? What is the group you're meeting with? And then they build a whole different report based on your own data. Set. So that is ultimately, they did 15 years of homework. You don't do this. Everything you guys have been describing, how much budget I'm spending, how many open you have, how effective. They even build a survey for the hiring manager. How effective your recruiter team. So they build every step. Where we spend the money in the past for this position, how long it took us, they add a scoring mechanism. You can see 15 years of everything that we sort of discussed here, they built it. And then they built diversity. How many diversity clients are you getting, applicants? Versus how many diversities there is in the market? They build the process. One reason I lock, look, we ha they presented this two years ago at a conference. I have a client that took a picture, told me this is a company you should buy. This is literally, and then when I saw the funnel, I'm like, this is what we're gonna buy. That funnel, I was like, wow. People, this is where you say, wow. Wow. All right, that's it. <laughs> so basically, they show you for every job how much visit you have, where you spend the money, where the applicant, where is the interview, and they helping us get beyond, get to talent management. You have to move everything in the grid. It's a broad bin tool, and then they build uh, how, uh, how much traffic you get in your website, what is the best source. Sometimes it could be career builder, it could be at a bank. This is why we're gonna keep a wall between broad bin and career builder. So they just got to measure every step. And then, Kelly, you see a demo of it? You want to, because you want one of the driver, one of the reason we acquired this company. You want, uh, this is too. Put you on the spot. Wow, look at that spot. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen a demo. We're, we're, uh, we're not using it as yet. Um, you know, Abdel, it, it is funny, because I was talking to Abdel um, quite a bit about trying to figure out some solution to bring the information together because we wanted to evolve our labor market research that the recruiters are taking to their uh, We wanted to evolve um, those needs, so not just labor market data, but internal data too, and to be able to actually sit down. You know, in, in my brain, I envisioned it, it's an iPad, you sit down and say, well, the last time we had this job, it took us, you know, 30 days to fill it, you had about 100 people that applied to it. Our best source was career builder. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and be able to run, run through all of that. Yeah, it's the street saver. I keep trying to get um, But being able to do that, to, to pull that data together to really make it, and to put it in a recruiter's hand was kind of the thing that we were thinking that we wanted to get to. And then he did um, spring this on, on me, which was uh, very fortuitous. It, it's, you know, something that we've, we've seen the functionality is, you know, as you described it, we have the music. We, you know, full disclosure, we have some challenges with our internet services. It's a regulated industry, and that means that there are, you know, data um, security. Yeah. And they have a whole other challenge that we, we, that's why we go back up, we're like, we're going to solve for other clients <laughs> because the regulation, all the regulation, how you store it, that's what we're working on. But this is where, I'm trying to tell you guys, we are listening to this type of conversation, we're taking the next level. You will see this evolving. We'll have lots of consumption. We need more your input and your feedback. The only reason we're going to succeed is if we solve some of your friction and some of your pain points. And as a data guy, I'm going to tell you, you got to get a story, you got to go to the next and talk to people, put the context around it. That's pretty much it. Thank you so much. It was a truly honor. Thank you.
that you're getting a top of the you're getting a You're getting a
Yeah. I grew up right near all your aviation. No, no, no. In Lynn, Mass. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Fox, that's where I used to drive by. The headquarters for aviation is in Cincinnati area. That must have been one of the engine plants or something back in the day. Is that? In Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think where they still do. I mean, it's a pretty big thing. It's not as much for Yeah. It's like because the new technologies are And we don't have the technologies that are made there. So the facility in Greenville, South Carolina. Was this a, a, is there a yoga mat here for a reason? Yes, what percentage of the workforce are GEs? Jennifer Lindsay's first. Half. Half. So that gentleman was coming in to just acquire it. We're, we've announced the intent to both boards have said yes. We're going to have our new So we're a year away. 